Professor, this topic, Professor Baker is going to speak about a hot topic, a topic that's always hot, it's interventional bronchoscopy, a topic that needs that more than one hour to discuss. Uh, Professor uh, Baker is uh, famous now in Egypt, he is well known, uh, he is uh, the head of the uh, endoscopic department, Heidelberg University, Germany. Please. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. I will speed up uh, to save the time. Uh, as you say, I'm Heinrich Becker, coming from Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, I was asked to talk about uh, interventional bronchoscopy, especially with regard to different instruments, the uh, flexible and rigid uh, bronchoscopes. Um, as you said, I'm part of the uh, head of the Department of Interdisciplinary Endoscopy, and this is one of our four rooms, and it's a room where we do all these kinds of uh, interventions. Uh, especially with regard to lung cancer, airway complications are very common. Uh, about up to 30% of the patients at the time of diagnosis present with airway stenosis, and during the time of uh, the cause of the disease, up to 50% uh, develop central airway stenosis. And in a large number of these patients, the central airway stenosis becomes the cause uh, uh, for dying. So uh, in our unit, up to 20% of uh, all bronchoscopies, we perform between three and a half to 4,000 uh, bronchoscopies per year. 20%, up to 20% are interventions. Interestingly, the first direct bronchoscopy that had been performed in 18, 19, uh, 1897 by Gustav Kilian in Freiburg was an intervention, a worker aspirated foreign body, piece of bone, and he, with his newly developed uh, instrument, went inside and uh, removed the foreign body. Uh, this is only a small list, I don't want to go through this, but showing how many indications for interventions we have today and how many techniques and tools we are having today. And so it's always important to have uh, an idea which tool is uh, apt for which uh, intervention. And also, I gave a lecture yesterday on this strategy, there are a lot of topics that you have to concern before you start the intervention. And during my talk, I will refer to, these, uh, to the list. Uh, the first feature, especially in central airway stenosis of the patient, is the urgency. Up to 60% of our patients come uh, in a status of emergency, imminent suffocation. Uh, this is uh, uh, frequently misdiagnosed because from outside, from listening, from chest x-ray, you don't see anything and only a closer look into the bronchi it gives you the idea what's happening. Uh, this is uh, very astonishing because even if the patient had a uh, history of potential trauma to the central airways after long-term intubation, only in half of the cases the correct diagnosis is made. Um, this is due to the fact that the central airways are hidden well inside the mediastinal structures and when you do a uh, plain x-ray, listen to the patients, they present as asthma and uh, even a central airway stenosis like this obstructing tumor can go, go, go unnoticed for a very long time. In this case, uh, frequently the patient cannot go uh, some radiological or functional exploration. So recently uh, we evaluated this uh, electronic micro, uh, microphone stethoscope uh, to see uh, the re uh, structures in the lung uh, this is a patient uh, with severe dyspnea coming from the chest pain unit after tracheotomy. And as you see on the left lung, not working, the left lung uh, has very low uh, energy uh, of this vibration, so something must be very wrong with the left side. Thank you very much. Also not working. Okay. And uh, when we look inside, you see she has, thank you very much, uh, she has this uh, extensive uh, coagular formation uh, going down to the left main bronchus, and uh, after removal, uh, the breathing of the lungs uh, is restored. 
And then we have to consider there are a lot of different causes for central airway stenosis. Malignant and benign, exophytic tumor growth, tumor growth uh, that only compresses the airways, tumor that is necrotizing and causing fistulas, uh, scar formations, granulomas, webs, instabilities of the central airways, and all need different approaches for treatment. Here you see a list of uh, benign uh, reasons for airway stenosis from compression to post-intubation stenosis. Um, this is, for example, a little child with uh, uh, respiratory distress uh, syndrome, and you see that it has a subglottic hemangioma. I thought it might be interesting for the pediatricians among you that uh, these hemangiomas that we formal times we did laser treatment respond very well to beta blocker treatment. So here you see uh, the ultrasound image of the uh, uh, hemangioma with all the vessels and after treatment uh, the hemangioma even after one week disappeared and this is also true for hemangiomas in the skin has been detected very recently. Of course, uh, when a patient comes in an emergency situation, uh, there is hardly any time for uh, extensive staging. So uh, it happens that we uh, miss to see the third one, thank you, uh, to see uh, tumor, uh, more extensive tumor spread. Uh, but uh, as most of the patients after intervention, for example, after placing a stand, they have a considerable good uh, um, quality of life, even for a few months. It can be meaningful for the patient, uh, for the quality of life. So this patient with central airway tumor and uh, stent can have a comfortable life and playing her trombone. Most patients, after we reopen the airways and place a stent, they uh, do their hobby. Uh, they smoke. This was a white stent, and now, after half a year of smoking, it's completely covered by this uh, smoke inhalation stuff. Um, of course, uh, you have uh, to consider the long-term results. Uh, this is a, a small child with uh, complex malformation and stenosis. So they have, a, when you cure them or when you can treat their central airway stenosis after recurrence, after surgery, they have a very good long-term perspective. The one thing that you have to consider is that uh, when you do the intervention, um, frequently it takes uh, up to, to uh, the closure of the airways down to about three to four millimeters until the patient becomes symptomatic. He's severely dysnoic, he's trying with high pressure uh, to move air but hardly moves uh, a few hundred millimeters of air through the stenosis. And this is where the question of uh, instrumentation comes into uh, perspective. In this case, for coring out and dilation of the airways, the rigid bronchoscope still is the best tool because you can shave off the tumor with the uh, tip of the bronchoscope, with the bevel of the bronchoscope, and ventilate the patient all through the procedure uh, uh, to keep the um, oxygen saturation stable. And basically, these instruments, uh, rigid bronchoscopes, didn't change a lot since the first invention. So you have this metal tube with the oblique uh, tip at the uh, bronchoscope, and you have uh, several side ports. Uh, one is for the attachment of the light source, one is for conventional ventilation, and this was for uh, entering uh, forcepses. Now we use the oblique port for jet ventilation and close this only in the case when we need additional oxygen, we use that. Uh, as the vision through these bronchoscopes is very small, you know, it's a very long thing, so your image is as small as uh, the nail of my uh, pinky finger, so we use telescope optics to look inside and uh, on these telescope optics we can attach uh, several instruments, uh, uh, forcepses, we can introduce suction catheters or these cotton swabs to stop the bleeding. And uh, this is uh, the rigid bronchoscope, the model by uh, Storz company. You have a lot of different tools that you can use, biopsy forcepses, foreign body forcepses, scissors to cut sutures, and so on.
When you go through this uh, central airways, they know this through the trachea. Frequently, the trachea is not straight. It is bent a little bit. And when you take the rigid bronchoscope and push it through, you have a risk that you perforate the trachea. So you use the rigid telescope optic. You transverse the stenosis with the optic. And over the optic, you screw the rigid bronchoscope through the stenosis. And the interesting thing is people are frequently afraid when they go through, they have bleeding, but as the bronchoscope is sitting very tightly inside the stenosis, it's compressing uh, the blood vessels. So while you remove the uh, retention of secretions, the bleeding, uh, the, ble uh, the vessels will be uh, closed and you don't have bleeding. And afterwards, you see, it's reopened and the patient can breathe again. So the indications for rigid bronchoscopy uh, in intervention have become very wide. Severe hemoptysis, resection of tumors, dilation and stent amplification in all kinds of stenosis, foreign body removal, especially in children, uh, biopsy of uh, tumor, tumors uh, that have a risk of bleeding, and especially in pediatric bronchoscopy is still widely used. Um, the rigid tube, of course, gives you always a safe entry to the airways for ventilation and for uh, surgery. And there are all different kinds of uh, bronchoscopes. This is from a group of friends of mine in Germany that developed this special uh, intervention bronchoscope where you can also attach uh, a measurement for CO2 uh, retention measuring and so on and all kinds of devices. This is the dumont ifer bronchoscope uh, with several ports that end at the tip of the bronchoscope. And with this uh, screw, you can move on that so you can introduce a laser probe and a suction catheter to laser. But it's a little bit clumsy because you have to turn and twist the bronchoscope inside the airways. And the airways have to be intubated with a rigid bronchoscope and have to be straight. Um, of course, you need uh, quite uh, uh, some equipment with a rigid bronchoscope, you know. Uh, you need general anesthesia, uh, the uh, uh, monitoring, and of course you need uh, a team with uh, anesthesiologist and anesthetist nurse to that. When you do these procedures with conventional ventilation, uh, as you blow in the air here, part of the air is going this way and part of the air is escaping. And so you need uh, this uh, fenestration always to close the instrument, then go through with your uh, uh, optic and forceps, then close it again. And it's very time consuming and clumsy. So when you have bleeding, a lot of secretions, you go in your suction, then you go out and then you go in the, with the instrument, bleeding is again. So um, it is not very easy to do it with these uh, instruments. This is why uh, in uh, rigid bronchoscopy, jet ventilation has been introduced by Sanders. The principle of jet ventilation, you have a compressor that is blowing in air and oxygen-enriched air uh, through this channel, through the side port. And uh, as you might notice when you are on the street and the lorry is passing fast, you see that the lorry is pulling air behind it, and this is the same, the jet ventilation goes down, yeah? and it also has kind of entrainment pulled in air, so you don't lose air outside the bronchoscope, so you can leave the proximal opening open and handle without any valve and uh, instrument, and this is much better for uh, interventions. To introduce the rigid bronchoscope, you can do it under direct vision, or you can introduce it uh, under uh, video assisted with the optics or you can use a laryngoscope. However, with a laryngoscope you lose a lot of space inside the mouth, so it's better to use the bronchoscope itself with a lip to lift up the epiglottis and go inside. So frequently when the uh, anesthesiologist cannot intubate a patient uh, with a laryngoscope, I still can take the optic, go through oral tracheal tube and with the optic I can intubate the patient. <clears throat> One thing you have to consider is uh, there is a misconception that the trachea goes straight inside the, the thorax. 
but the trigger is going a little bit backwards. So if you over recline, recline the, the head of the patient, you have a tendency to hit uh, to the anterior wall of the larynx. So the patient should be in a comfortable resting position and then the endoscope follows the path uh, of the trachea. <coughs> As uh, said before, the advantages with the rigid bronchoscope uh, are uh, safe ventilation, optimal control uh, uh, for ventilation and bleeding and uh, during interventions, and of course, in, uh, gen under general anesthesia, the procedure is more comfortable for the patient and also for the interventionalist. And uh, uh, when you do procedures through the rigid bronchoscope, they are much faster to be done. Of course, the equipment and all the surrounding instruments uh, are more expensive than if you do only flexible bronchoscopy under local anesthesia. You need uh, some special training, especially for intervention procedures. And of course, you need anesthesiologists, uh, ventilation machine, jet ventilator, and uh, the general anesthesia. The complications that you can have with rigid bronchoscopy are pretty common, like with other interventions. Also, bleeding, uh, hypoxemia, sometimes pneumothorax. Uh, of course, you have to be careful not to damage teeth and uh, the airways. Uh, and uh, with jet ventilation, there have been very rare per, uh, reports after you open a small vessel with intervention that you can have uh, air embolism. But uh, already for a long time, uh, Stratling, who published one of the first bronchoscopy atlases in 86, he said uh, it's mandatory uh, that uh, uh, bronchoscopist who goes into intervention knows uh, how to deal with the bronchoscope and has the instrument at hand. However, not unfrequently have we have patients uh, that have uh, problems so you cannot introduce the rigid bronchoscope into the airways and then you need a different instrument and also sometimes the lesions and the uh, foreign bodies, bleedings, tumors are beyond the reach of the rigid bron uh, bronchoscope so you need some instrument to go there and this is the flexible bronchoscope this is one of the, of the older types, the fiber bronchoscopy. Nowadays we have video chip bronchoscopes, but it's just to show that also for the fiber optics we have different instruments, laser probes, uh, all kinds of forcepses, brushes, needles, foreign body forcepses. So uh, the armatory for the uh, flexible bronchoscopes is similar as that for the rigid bronchoscopes. And for the flexible bronchoscopes, we have all kinds of uh, bronchoscopes, very large bronchoscopes with large channels, so you can go with big forcepses, very small uh, bronchoscopes, so you can go far uh, into the periphery, and you can also go to very narrow airways and pass them and uh, do interventions behind that. And uh, the flexible bronchoscope has been, become the instrument of choice when you have uh, complications, for example, on the intense care unit with retention of secretions, uh, bleeding, and so on, to treat patients under uh, local anesthesia. <laughs> However, the problem is uh, when you have this kind of central airway stenosis that I showed before, and you start to do intervention with a flexible bronchoscope, uh, it's hard to ventilate the patient through this uh, stenosis. Only if the patient can tolerate a short phase of uh, apnea, after a good pre-oxygenation, you can go down with a balloon and dilate the uh, stenosis. But uh, when the patient has good access, like here in tracheotomy, you can go down. And uh, the first bronchoscopists, when they could go directly into the airways with the instruments, they called it autoscopy, self-expection. So with a flexible bronchoscope, the patient can even use the bronchoscope himself and explore the airways. But Usually that's not done. Um, sometimes when you have uh, not easy access to the airways, this tracheostomized patient, you cannot go down, could not go down with a rigid bronchoscope. You can pass with several instruments. This is a jet ventilation catheter. 
This is the bronchoscope, and this is a stent introducer to place a stent into a lower airway stenosis. Um, if you want to go from above with a flexible bronchoscope, uh, the laryngeal mask has become very useful uh, where the uh, end of the mask is placed in front of the larynx and you can pass with the endoscope uh, through the mask and do uh, interventions uh, over this side port uh, for ventilation. So you can do it under general anesthesia with a flexible instrument. It has become very popular now that for interventions we use both instruments together. We use the rigid bronchoscope for safe intubation, for jet ventilation, and then for easier handling of the instruments we go through with a flexible bronchoscope. Here you see that in an animal model, the rigid bronchoscope is inside the trachea for ventilation, flexible endoscope goes through, and here we have argoplasma coagulation because with a flexible endoscope, it's uh, very easy to maneuver the instruments uh, along the airways. So some examples here, you see uh, typical anastomosis after sleeve resection. Uh, this is an anastomosis where there was uh, covered dehiscence and the anastomosis is shutting down so the patient after the closing of the anastomosis has uh, complete atelectasis of the remaining lung. So we go down, sometimes with a needle, to find the way into the uh, airway behind the stenosis with contrast medium. Then we go with ultrasound probes, and we see the uh, thickness of the wall and the relation to the pulmonary artery. So when we dilate, we don't perforate into the pulmonary artery. Then we go down with a guide wire. Via the guide wire, we put down a balloon. I fill the balloon with uh, water and some contrast medium to control under fluoroscopy, uh, safe uh, dilation. Also, you can go with the tip of the bronchoscope, look inside the balloon and see the mucosa to prevent complete uh, tear of the bronchus, and then you dilate the stenosis. Here you see the tear in the, mu uh, in the mucosa, but the submucosa and connective tissue is intact. And to prevent recurrence of the stenosis, we apply locally apply mitomycin C that we soak uh, with this cotton swab, put it down into the stenosis and leave it there for five minutes, locally uh, application, and then it prevents fibroblast growth. And uh, in uh, repeat interventions, when we do this two, three times, after some time, uh, the stenosis stays open. But uh, in other times, when you have repeat stenosis via guide wire, you can place uh, stents uh, to keep the anastomosis open. So this can all be done with a flexible instrument. Of course, when you do intervention, you have to know all kinds of uh, treatments that you can do. Not only interventional bronchoscopy, but also thoracic surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, to have the best concept for treatment of the patient. So after dilation of the stenosis, we assess the extent of the stenosis Call the thoracic surgeon, he says, okay, I can do segmental resection after the patient is stabilized. This is after segmental resection, the anastomosis, and the patient is cured. Sometimes, especially in keloid formers, uh, we have repeat recurrent stenosis even after surgery. So remove all the, we remove all the sutures, laser the stenosis, and this is a uh, few years later, stable uh, anastomosis without recurrence of stenosis. And then, of course, you have to know all the uh, different bronchoscopic means for treatment of central airway stenosis. These are the two main types of post-intubation stenosis. This is only mucosal disease. The wall is intact and you have a web. Whereas here, you have a complex stenosis with infiltration of the whole wall, calcification of the uh, cartilages. Though this you can treat by local treatment and cut, but you cannot remove endoscopically uh, the uh, complex stenosis. So web-like stenosis can be treated, for example, by electrocautery. Electrocautery uh, is a treatment by high-frequency electric current. You have an indifferent electrode that sends the current to the tissue, different electrode that you fix at the leg, and where the concentration of the electrons is very high, 
uh, you generate heat and destroy tissue. There are different devices for the rigid bronchoscope for coagulation, removing snares for removing tumors, and also flexible instruments uh, for the flexible bronchoscope that you can use to treat this stenosis. The advantage is it is uh, very cheap. It has immediate effect. Uh, the risk of perforation and making fires are very low, and it's very cost effective. In former times, I showed you the first resection after the um, recurrence of the stenosis. In former times, we did complete resection, but then we had repeat restenosis. So currently, we are doing only these incisions in the stenosis, usually three incisions. And in a high uh, number of cases, we succeed with that. This is a paper uh, by Atul. I don't know whether he's here. Um, uh, where he could show that in two-thirds of the cases he was successful with mitomycin C and all these uh, additional treatments, success rate is uh, much higher. If this fails after three times, either you have to resort to surgery. If the patient is not operable, you place a stent. So this is uh, wet-like stenosis. Um, you go through with the instrument, you measure the length of the stenosis, and then you go down with your electrocautery probe, you put out the electric knife, and uh, then you touch the tissue. In a moment you see, you touch the tissue, and then you coagulate and make a cut here, make a cut here, make a cut here. Afterwards, you go through with your rigid bronchoscope, dilate, apply mitomycin C, and then usually the stenosis is gone. Of course, you have to reconsider uh, also always to uh, ask the surgeon whether he cannot really repair the whole thing. Uh, it can be very risky if you place a stent here, is a metallic stent inside the stenosis, and you have a lot of granuloma formation and reobstruction. And then by placing a stent, the stenosis can become longer and the patient can no longer be operable. But this is why you first have to consult uh, the thoracic surgeon. As I told you, this complex stenosis cannot be treated by laser or by uh, electrocautery. You just have to splint uh, the stenosis by inserting a stent. And you should always use a removable and replaceable stent, no metallic stent. Uh, because especially these metallic stents uh, can be easily applied inside the airways. You see, they are introduced by catheter. You pull at the rope and uh, the stent explores, so uh, a lot of people like to do that because it's so easy. Uh, so they frequently they say, you yeah, know, it's a thing for the beginners, but uh, there has been recently a warning by the FDA uh, against uh, placing metallic stents into benign stenosis because the uh, rate of complications is very high and when a stent is ingrown and completely occluded, it's very hard to remove it from the central airway. So always in these benign stenosis, always, if possible, after at all, place silicone stents. And the approach for post-intubation stenosis is do rigid bronchoscopy. If you see web and granuloma, go down with a neoglymiac laser, electrocautery. If it's open, just follow up. Uh, if it has the third recurrence, ask the surgeon whether he can operate. If the patient is successfully operated, just follow up. If the patient is unoperable, uh, then, uh, or he has a complex stenosis, try to place a removable stent. If the patient is inoperable and the stenosis is not going away, leave the stent and just follow up. If uh, the patient is operable after that, uh, send him to surgery. If he cured, follow up. If he has a recurrence, then go back to a stand and then afterwards follow up. We thought in the beginning that when we place a stand, after half a year, one year, we can remove the stand and the wall will have stabilized. This is not, not uh, true. You see, um, only uh, th three out of 17 uh, of the patients that uh, Marquette and Lear showed really were cured by temporary standing. A lot needed surgery, some even were tracheotomized, and a large number of patients 
really had permanent scenting. So this dealing with this complex uh, post intervention stenosis is really uh, not very easy. When you have stenosis due to endoluminal tumor growth, uh, you can go down with all kinds of devices, for example, uh, with cryotherapy probes. Uh, cryotherapy, uh, this is uh, nitrogen that is going down and uh, cooling down the probe. You freeze the tissue surrounding the probe and then you can remove the tissue. This can be done with a flexible endoscope with this, uh, with this probe and you see the specimens you get are much larger than the specimens that you can get with the small flexible forceps. The easiest thing, however, is to take uh, the rigid bronchoscope, take the rigid forceps, and you see how big pieces of necrotic material you can remove. Now the airway is reopened and uh, the lung is reventilated. Um, when the stenosis is more peripheral and you cannot remove it and you have post-obstructive pneumonia or post-obstructive abscess formation and the patient is in septicemia and cannot be operated on, you can go down with the guide wire. Via the guide wire you put down um, pigtail catheter. The pigtail catheter here in the cavitation is exoduced through via the nose. <coughs> you put in a bag, you remove all the poor and secretions you wash with antibiotics and afterwards, not unfrequently, the patient improves and then can be operated. This is this cavitating, necrotizing tumor without, without uh, lymph node metastasis, so the patient after that was cured. Um, a lot of techniques that I described right now are techniques where you touch the tissue. So you have a risk of bleeding or when you take the cryoprobe, you have a risk of additional obstruction of the airways. So methods uh, with uh, out uh, contact, mechanical contact uh, are favored now. So this is uh, the laser, for example, that has been become very popular uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. But uh, currently the uh, most uh, uh, frequently applied non-contact method is the argon plasma coagulation. It's high frequency electrocautery, but you don't touch the tissue, but you have argon gas that is conducting the uh, electricity to the tissue. Um, the argon gas is heated, and by heating, uh, the electrons are driven out of the atoms, so you have uh, uh, the electrons going down to the tissue and causing the uh, burning uh, heating effect uh, while argon gas, uh, argon ions around uh, the area where you treat uh, are shielding uh, the area that you treat uh, by, from uh, oxygen so you have a low risk of uh, fire when you use that. And one of the advantages with the argon plasma coagulation is that it is not only going straight forward, but it can also, also go sideways uh, to the airways, which, uh, for example, in case of this uh, small tumor metastasis in the trachea, is very useful because you can, without touching, you can destroy the tissue uh, parallel to the probe. So argon uh, co plasma coagulation has become very popular because it's not so deeply infiltrating, for example, in treatment of uh, extensive laryngeal tracheal papillomatosis. This is after argon plasma resection, and then we used to treat this patient additionally with interferon uh, or other more like uh, 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 biologicals nowadays. However, you have to be aware when you have a very narrow airway and you start to do argon plasma coagulation, you cannot really direct it. So the argon plasma can go uh, to the tumor as well as to the normal tissue, and you have to be very careful not to do additional uh, damage, especially if you have vessels close to the wall. But it has become so popular because it's easy to use, to, you have it easily at hand, and it's uh, very cost effective, much uh, cheaper than uh, the laser. So mainly it's used for treatment of hemoptysis, obstruction of airways, superficial lesions like papillomatosis and so on. But you have to be very careful not to use it in the vicinity of plastic material, not to have fire with a lot of oxygen, 
especially when you start to uh, treat with argon plasma. And if the argon plasma is going back to the endoscope, you see here the fire uh, destroyed uh, the endoscope. So you have to be very careful. Flush the airways with argon gas to prevent oxygen uh, from uh, getting in contact with the electricity. Sometimes shut down for a short while the high frequency ventilation, not to blow the argon gas away and communicate with the anesthesiologist uh, to turn down the oxygen. Before the laser has been uh, very popular, uh, this is a laser machine uh, developing a very concentrated laser light uh, that is very focused and uh, is very strong. So you can destroy tissue, you coagulate the tissue, and when you increase the energy, the tissue is completely destroyed, vaporized, and uh, uh, carbonized and you can easily reopen the central airways. Of course you can only treat what you see, obstruction by esophagic tumor, combination of obstruction and bleeding, uh, check valve mechanisms, uh, atelectasis. This is what you can approach with laser and also with APC. Here you see penetrating lymph node, that's the primary tumor, lymph node penetrating occluding the trachea and you can easily resect the uh, lesion and re reopen. <coughs> when you have malaysia or you have only compression you cannot treat neither with argon plasma nor with laser because you destroy the wall and uh, the problem will increase. Tumors uh, like sometimes heart syndrome tumors that are growing like icebergs you know only small intraluminal and big extraluminal part <coughs> cannot be cured and of course where you cannot go with the laser and the instrument you cannot treat it. This is uh, malatic stenosis, complex malatic stenosis. You see after resection, when you start to do lasering here, you easily perfor perforate uh, the wall. And again, uh, when a patient comes with severe dyspnea bleeding, you coagulate and resect, and then you can send the patient to the thoracic surgeon if he is resectable and uh, resect him. Sometimes you have to do additional therapies like barotherapy. <coughs> the main risks of uh, yeah, laser treatment, uh, inhalation trauma by uh, smoke, uh, so you have to remove the smoke, this is RDS transient RDS syndrome after smoke inhalation injury. In this case uh, the uh, bronchoscopist set the bronchoscope in fire and the burning bronchoscope was pulled out the patient so he has burn marks in the trachea and here you see the burn mark at the face of the patient when the burning instrument was removed from the airways. So be extremely careful because within fractions of a second the temperature can rise and all plastic material has its firing ignition point at 98 degrees and uh, easily you can set uh, oral tracheal tubes with a low power laser uh, to, uh, to fire. So be extremely careful. And you see the power the laser has, this is a, a brass metal uh, tip hub at the end of the laser probe and when you have uh, blood also on the tip of the probe and the energy is uh, absorbed at the tip of the probe you can melt down the metal so uh, it can be very very hot. So to prevent complications I prefer to use the rigid bronchoscope under general anesthesia with jet ventilation I try to turn the oxygen not more than 40% and by continuous suction I remove the smoke and prevent uh, smoke inhalation trauma and uh, uh, fire. This is extensive tumor at the bifurcation. Here you see the main bronchus and trachea after laser resection. Uh, the patient have uh, comparatively good survival time, up to 20%, survive for up to three years and more, but uh, we like to add different therapy to uh, uh, prolong the effect, and uh, for that we like to use uh, high uh, dose radiation brachytherapy. Uh, we place the brachytherapy catheters under local anesthesia uh, with a flexible endoscope into the patient. The radiotherapist introduces via computer technology the uh, iridium-192 radioactive probe and we irradiate uh, the airways and here you see the same patient two years later without endoscopic and histological tumor residuals. 
in those cases where with this combined therapy we can achieve complete remission uh, up to 30% uh, uh, free of tumor uh, after five years and more, which is uh, by oncological definitions is cure. However, in the long term, we can have side effects of this high dose radiation. You see this is the scar two years later. This is the scar uh, uh, four years later. <coughs> and for these uh, situations, we have the stents, uh, especially in complex stenosis. Here we have the histones after sleeve pulmonectomy. You see the fistula patient has severe emphysema. We place this covered stent. Unfortunately, this is broken, but the stent covers the fistula. The fistula can heal, and the emphysema disappears. To assess uh, the size of the stent, you can go down with the forceps, look for the diameter. You pass with the endoscope through the stenosis. At the entrance, you, you measure, and you pull it to the other end of the stenosis, and from that, you can measure the uh, length of the stent that you need and uh, uh, choose the stent accordingly. Uh, there is another device now that you place inside the stenosis, you pull it and open the branches and then you can read at the proximal end, you can read whether it's uh, 12, 14 or 16 millimeters that you need uh, uh, to place a stent. And with stenting we also can treat complex stenosis. This is large esophageal tracheal fistula after radiotherapy. We put down in former times foam cuff tube into the esophagus so the patient can swallow the fistula is sealed and to keep the bronchus open, we place an additional stent into the airway. Nowadays, we do it with uh, two uh, metallic expandable stents. And as you see, uh, uh, in almost all the cases, we could seal the fistula either by placing tracheal stents or stents from both sides. And some of the patients have uh, quite uh, considerable uh, long survival time with these severe complications. The problem with stenting is we have bands, we have branches, we have rigid and flexible structures in the airways. The stent should, as the airways, uh, re-expand and should uh, also transport the secretions out of the airways. Uh, while placing the uh, stent, the patient should be safely ventilated the fixation should be stable, and the stand should be sa stable against all the mechanical influences from outside, and it should be resistant when you have to remove uh, granuloma formation or in case of complications, it should be easily uh, replaced. This is uh, the boy I showed before with his uh, central airway stenosis, and in the beginning we didn't have a dedicated uh, plastic stand, so we had to find ways to cover a stand and place this stand uh, inside, this is uh, after uh, six years after stand placement, we had to replace it once. Uh, and uh, the guy is uh, after now, after uh, 17 years, he is still alive and uh, is doing his training as apprentice in a governmental institution. Um, you always have to uh, consider the evasiveness and the risk of your procedures, as I showed before, and uh, I always uh, prefer to combine methods with immediate effect, mechanical resection, balloon dilation, laser, argoplasma, and then combine it with uh, procedures like additional stand placing, placement, photodynamic therapy, high dose radiation, to have long-term results long-term effect after these uh, interventions. And last not least, and uh, this will bring me to the end of my lecture, uh, you have to consider cost effectiveness. If you consider the price for a silicone plastic stand, it is 350 euros in our country. If you have a metallic covered self-expanding stand, uh, frequently, it's even more than 1,000 euros. And when you set up an interventional unit and you uh, do a, a lot of these procedures, you have to consider that you have to find some way for reimbursement. Otherwise, uh, with placing, we place about 100 to 120 stands per year. Uh, otherwise, if you don't find a way for reimbursement, you can completely destroy the hospital budget. So. If you intend to do intervention, you have to have the special, the special knowledge you need.
you have to have the special training, you have to have the special um, setting with the anesthesiologist, uh, as I explained before, and uh, you have to consider the costs. However, even if you have high costs for interventional bronchoscopy, if you closely analyze your environment and you are the center uh, in a large region with a large population and there is not in, uh, interventional bronchoscopy around you, when you start a program with interventional bronchoscopy, you start low with electrocautery, with balloon dilation and so, you will attract a lot of patients. And the physicians that know that you are starting this program will send you more and more patients. And frequently you see this patient is not a candidate for intervention, but it's a candidate for the medical oncologist, for the radiotherapist, and especially for the thoracic surgeon. You will also generate a lot of work and a lot of income for the other departments. And with this kind of strategy, when you approach your CEO and you can say, of course, it's not cheap, but for the whole hospital, it is effective. Now, then I think you can successfully introduce uh, interventional uh, bronchoscopy department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Baker. It's a very uh, uh, up-to-date uh, presentation about uh, bronchoscopy, interventional bronchoscopy, so it's no more flexible or rigid bronchoscopy, it's bronchoscopy, whether rigid or flexible. Uh, just one uh, before uh, question, I have one in, uh, inquiry about, uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, air embolism among complications of rigid bronchoscopy, air embolism as a complication of rigid bronchoscopy, and in your experience, how far is it common? I have, I have one patient where I saw air embolism after the bronchoscopy. He had uh, aortic aneurysm. The aortic aneurysm perforated into the left main bronchus and a big coagulum, organized coagulum, uh, was in the, obstructing the left main bronchus with total atelectasis. I started to remove it um, with uh, APC. <coughs> And when I almost completely had removed it with the jet ventilation or the APC, in APC it has been also reported that you can have embolism. The patient afterwards had uh, transient uh, uh, cerebral embolism, but uh, the side effects disappeared again. So the jet ventilation, when you open a small vessel or with the argon plasma coagulation, because the argon also uh, yeah. is introduced under pressure, you can, in rare, rare, rare instances, you can have uh, embolism. Very uh, Thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, I am Dr. Rajan Santosham from Chennai, India. I enjoyed your presentation. It was a lovely presentation. I am a thoracic surgeon. In India, we get a lot of patients with tracheal stenosis. And one of the, all the facts that you said, that's a combined effort of the pulmonologist, the surgeon, <coughs> and the radiotherapist. And most important is, cases which are localized and which can be stented or dilated, I mean, which can be dilated, should be dilated. But more than that, like the complex cases that you have shown, I think we should involve the surgeon. And more importantly, one of the things that I have noticed is if you do laserization too much on a complicated stenosis which is amenable to surgery, the wall of the trachea gets very hard and thickened and the length of obstruction that you've got to remove becomes longer. So thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. You, you are completely right. Uh, it's not only with the lasering, but also with other methods. For example, when you have a stenosis and you want to place a stent, the stent has to be longer than the stenosis to prevent migration. So at least half a centimeter above, half a centimeter below. And when you place this stent and the patient afterwards at the end of the stent develops granuloma formation and additional uh, inflammatory change of the bronchial wall, the stenosis can be longer than it was before and before it could be operable and afterwards yeah. you can have made it inoperable. So you have immediately after you carefully open up, you have to ask, I, I call the thoracic surgeon when I have the patient under general anesthesia on the operation table, I show him the situation and I say, 
do you think this patient is oral? He says, no, not at the time. He just had a heart attack. This is why he had intubation or he had the brain stroke. But in half a year, he can be operable. So you have to bear, be very careful not to do a permanent solution, not to prevent the patient yeah. from surgery. And also the fact that you said that expandable stents, as far as possible, should be avoided for benign tracheal obstruction. I think that's a take-home message, and thank you very much. Yeah, this is why the FDA uh, published the Please. warning against these uh, metal stents. Uh, we have time for a uh, couple of questions. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very overwhelming expose to, to quote Professor Hosni uh, about this uh, interventional bronchoscopy. Uh, we are having with us two of the uh, godfathers of bronchoscopy in Egypt, Professor Suleiman in Kasraini, Professor Hassan Hosni in Cairo, in Ain Shams University, and uh, they might have witnessed with me the rigid bronchoscope and then there was no fiber optic bronchoscopy. When the fiber optic bronchoscope was introduced, uh, everybody thought that uh, the rigid bronchoscope died peacefully and there is no need to revive it. And I'm really happy that it is now having uh, its role. Uh, my point is about hemoptysis as an indication for uh, bronchoscopy because the old standard orthodox teaching with us was that it is a rather relative contraindication for bronchoscopy because one point blood, one blood drop on the lens or on the light would appear as if it is a sea of bleeding and then it would uh, overwhelm the field and you could not be able to proceed any further. Now I see that it is the first indication in, in your uh, talk in the rigid bronchoscope and I can appreciate this because uh, with the hemopsis, the rigid bronchoscope is a better uh, instrument than the flexible because it uh, can identify the site of, of the bleeding. It can compress it by a means to, to, in a trial to, to stop it. And so it is no more uh, a contraindication. My inquiry goes to two points. One point is about migration of the stents and its problems, and the other point goes to what they call now alveoloscopy. Is it now in real practice? Um, I didn't get your second question, but maybe maybe the first question was mi migration. Um, uh, if you choose the right correct size of the stent yeah, uh, and uh, the correct length, usually the stent is undersized, or sometimes when you have elastic stenosis and you place the stand, which is the correct stand at, this, at the time of placement, but the wall gives way, then the stand can move. But, uh, and of course, uh, migration is more frequent with silicone plastic stands or with completely covered metallic stands than with the partially uncovered metallic stands. But with the correct size, uh, it is, has become pretty rare. Um, with regard to your comments to Richie Bronchoscopy, uh, this was the reason why I was in, uh, uh, the f invited to Japan for the first time in 1989, because they had lost the knowledge of Richie Bronchoscopy, and a friend of mine, thoracic surgeon Professor Ohata, invited me to go to Japan to teach and bring back the skills. And now we have a lot of, in uh, of courses for interventional bronchoscopy, like you have here. Uh, you know, all over the world and bring it back because no intervention, uh, interventional uh, department can be open without that. But the second question I, I couldn't understand. Hemopsis? Hemopsis. Hemopsis, he, he said, he, is, he, is, he, he wanted, he, hemoptysis of course has become a very important indication because even if you cannot completely stop the bleeding, it, I will go, go back. I will. Alveoloscope. Yeah. Um, uh, alveoloscopy is still a method under investigation. This uh, method has very high resolution. It's a very small catheter that can, you can introduce in the peripheral airways, and you can see all kinds of structures down to cellular structures. However, uh, currently we have to develop an atlas 
to see what the structures are that we see with our, our radioscopy. Now, uh, I have read a, a quite amount of uh, preliminary papers where they go somewhere into the lung, they describe something, but they don't have direct correlation. So, for example, when I started to develop endo, uh, endobronchial ultrasound, I took operation specimens from the operation theater, went in vitro, had the histology, macropathology, uh, ultrasound image, and then uh, I could match that. And this, these things are still widely missing, so uh, uh, this is a method that has to find its place in the future. I didn't go into, into diagnosis, but the combination, you know, with autofluorescence or with molecular markers for screening, autofluorescence for localization, endobronchial ultrasound, EOCT for uh, local staging and then local treatment, that's a very complex issue that's by far not solved and I think it will take us another five to ten years to really know where all these technologies have their place. What I also didn't show is that uh, with the increase of computer capacity, so uh, the capacity of computer chip uh, is doubling uh, every uh, 18 to 24 months, the technology is increasing exponentially and so also new technologies are coming faster and faster and we don't know the place. Just a one more uh, comment from Professor Tarek Safat. Hi, and thank you so much for this uh, wonderful overview. I wonder, I understood that after sleeve resection, uh, trachea or uh, the main sleeve resection, do you apply, you apply mitomycin because we're usually afraid of the dehiscence which can, uh, which can happen. I I apply the mitomycin when I have excessive granuloma formation or scar formation. Then already, the, you know, when you have a dehiscence or covered dehiscence, you wait. Yeah? And you, we go down with the ultrasound and look whether uh, there is an abscess surrounding or there is imminent perforation into the pulmonary artery. But only when you have excessive granuloma formation, scar formation, you resect it and then you apply mitomycin C. Although the mitomycin has only very local effect and no uh, deeper effect and no systemic so side you, effect. So you apply it only after the, if you have the recurrence. Only when, you, and only when you have stenosis, also uh, post-intubation stenosis, every time you have after resection, you have re-stenosis, you apply it locally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baker. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for the next session.